Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor, and yesterday my son's travel ball got rained out. We were in our we we drove an hour and a half away. We were sitting there and we we watched another team play, and then right about the time my son's team came up to be able to bat, we get rained out. My son did hit a bomb that was caught right before the rain out was called, right before the game was called. And then we had to drive right back home. But the good news about that is that I didn't have to stay at the fields until nine o'clock at night. And I think we may have been there that late because my son's team was beating everybody. And so uh, we probably would have had to stay to play a championship game. So from, in the, from that perspective, I didn't have to come home and be completely tired that night. Okay. Wanted to show you this to start this video out. Um, XRP Crypto Wolf, who is a friend, um, has uh, he asked me. I've never done one of these. I've never done an, a, a video interview ever, and I've never done a written interview e either. Really, just because I've kind of stayed in my lane and done my own thing, um, not really for many other reasons other than that. But he did it. He sent me a series of questions, and it took me two weeks to get them back to him. And I apologized for that, but I did get them back to him yesterday and he put up his coil blog and you guys need to go here. I'll click on it. it says digital asset investor. My second coil article is an interview with my very good friend, digital asset investor. So check it out to find out extremely interesting information about the digital asset investor and his investments that most people don't know. And here is his, um, this is his coil blog. You can follow him on his core blog at, at XRP Crypto Wolf. That's his blog. Um, I'll show you just uh, one, of the, one of my answers that he, he asked me that I, I gladly answered this because I lot, this is one of my things. What's your best advice that you would give to millennials? That's an easy one. Winners focus on winning. Losers focus on winners. Don't worry about what other people are doing. I tell my sons this all the time. Don't focus, like in, like in baseball, just as a for instance, don't focus on what this other player is doing. That is not your problem. Your problem is perfecting your game. Your problem is, become, is practicing to become the best hitter you can be and practicing to become the best first baseman you can be. Your problem is not how so-and-so is pro progressing and whether or not you think you're better than him at first base or hitting. If you focus on the the um, what you're working on, it's just a matter of time before you will be the best first baseman and you will be the best hitter. But if you get sidetracked by envy of the other guy and how he hits and how how you think you're better than him, that is a waste of your time and of his time. Focus on making yourself better. Focus in as like a laser beam on making yourself and focusing on making you better at whatever it is you do. Trying to look at what other people are doing is a big, huge, monumental waste of time. All right. And then I go on to talk about how you got to work your butt off and be passionate. And, and then my favorite quote. And then my final thing here is my father made me memorize that quote as a kid. One other thing, listen to The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale at least 20 times. And you can listen to that on YouTube, by the way. Type it in. Trust me. Okay. Um, now, Cryptopolis had, um, Cryptopolis had, had uh, tweeted this out. Um, and he says, the dollar index moves higher and this is, uh, and, and is up this morning. It's counterintuitive, defying logic. When there's been so much stimulus, but but that often that's often how markets work. The stocks rose in April, May, June, even as 30 million became unemployed. It's it's defying logic is the new norm. Um, and he's got this. The this was a tweet of his that he's retweeting. U.S. debt, U.S. total debt, corporate, personal, student, auto, etc. 77 trillion. The Fed's balance sheet is 7 trillion. The U.S. dollar will rally because demand for USD 
to pay massive debt exceeds the supply of dollars. If Fed BS exceeds demand, then we'll see the USD collapse. Thoughts? Well, bottom line is what he's saying here about this defying logic um, is so true. But if you remember, those of you that, that have watched The Big Short, the movie about the 2008 financial crisis and the guys that, betted, uh, that bet against the housing market, you remember, and if you haven't seen that, you got to go watch it because it is the times we're in. Um, but those guys bet against the housing market. And then when the, the mortgage defaults began, there was a period of time where they were like, why is our investment not going up? And they thought they had been defrauded or something. And, and they actually went to the S&P and the woman at the S&P, they're like, how can you be rating all of these, these um, mortgage bonds or mortgage backed securities? How can you be rating these as AAA when there are, you've got all these defaults going on and they're, they're basically the S&P lady says, well, the people who are getting us to rate them are the people that created them. So they, so there's like a major conflict of interest. Well, that's, that's probably not much different than what's going on right now. You, you've got the U.S. and a U.S. controlled financial media who is, who is touting what they want to tout. But. The thing is that eventually truth catches up to everything, just like it did in the financial crisis. You can only BS for so long. And what the feds have been doing with all their money printing and all these programs and, and being trillions in debt, now 26 trillion in debt, that lie can only last so long. A lie will not last. It will not stand the test of time. Um, no lies do. Okay. And so, what I do is just like Greg Kidd told me, he said, he said, why would you not hold something like XRP or Bitcoin that has a limited amount that can't be manipulated? That was one of the first things he said to me. And it's true. It's, it's the first reason that I arrived at this party. I later found out how, what Ripple was working on and all, and how big I thought it was going to be. But this will all be caught up. Now watch, let's expound on this. He's talking about how it doesn't make any sense that the dollar is going up in value. Well, this is from X big time, how the coming crash in the dollar will unfold. Now this is a, this is Bloomberg that is now writing this article, how the coming crash in the dollar will unfold. The argument, that there's no alternative to the U S currency makes little sense. Now I'm not going to go into the article. What's important to me is that the article was written a few years ago. They weren't writing articles like this folks. So, this right here tells me a lot. All right. Now look at this. This is from new creation capital. He says why the dollar will collapse if it doesn't go digital explained in two minutes, 20, two, 2020, two minutes, 20 seconds. Makes sense that in order to avoid this, well, create the digital dollar, then cut to XRP as ODL. Can you smell it coming? Watch this video. It's great. That we owe. So there you go. Now, um, for those of you, if you did, if you're watching my video and you didn't see this video, it's because there's music. I just played this by at, at new creation cap. And if you didn't see the video, it's because I had to take it out because sometimes when there's music over these videos, I get a copyright hit. And so I had to take it out if you're not watching it. So you can go and watch that new creation capital on his Twitter feed. Okay. Moving along. Now, this is also interesting. This is from Real XRP uh, Boy, and this also has to do with all, all of this, the dollar and everything. This is Judy Shelton. We need a stable dollar, not just for economic reasons, but also for strategic reasons in the geopolitical sense. We have rivals out there, and when the exchange rate value of the dollar can be shifted by what other central banks do, it can have the effect of neutralizing or even reversing what we're trying to accomplish for our own nation's economy. Just think, uh, you want corporations to move back to the U.S. You want them to repatriate cash, and you're going to lower the corporate tax rate to get them to do that. That's great. But then the dollar shifts, and they will have to consider whether it will cost them more in currency losses than they would save on taxes by coming back. Or maybe you're trying to renegotiate trade agreements and you're wondering whether you should impose a tariff or a surtax on goods imported from Mexico or Japan. And then the yen and the peso depreciate against the dollar 
so that goods imported from those countries are still cheaper for Americans to buy. I find it ironic when I hear world leaders talking today, making speeches at Davos, at the International Economic Forum, people like Chinese President Xi Jinping saying, oh, we need to preserve our rules-based global trading system. When he says that, of course, he's insinuating that America has abandoned its leadership role. And he's suggesting that President Trump doesn't believe in free trade. But that's not true. He does believe in free trade. He's said so many times, but it has to be fair. You have to have a level playing field. It is totally unfair and nonsensical to talk about a rules-based global trading system and not talk about currency manipulation and the effect of exchange rate movements on trade and capital flows. We don't have a level monetary playing field because there are no rules. We have not had a rules-based international monetary system since President Nixon ended the Bretton Woods Agreement. There you go. If you really, if you've been watching this channel for a while, you can really see how everything kind of is tying together now and it's coming together and it's starting to make sense in your mind. And watch what I'm about to show you and it'll really come together even more. Watch. So this is from, this is a tweet from Corey Johnson. Now remember, Corey Johnson, none of this is by accident, folks. I'm convinced. Remember, so Brad Garlinghouse the other day puts out this Zoom call with his employees and he's talking all of a sudden about XRP and Ripple and Ethereum and these type of things being a safe haven. Okay, this is in the middle of all this craziness going on in the economy right now. Money printing, $26 trillion in debt, all this stuff. Meanwhile, Corey Johnson, like within a day, follows it up with a tweet where he's talking about the same exact thing um, in a video interview that he was doing. Where he's talking about um, these things being a place as a safe haven type thing. And now he's writing for Forbes, Corey Johnson, who used to be Ripple's spokesperson. Now he's writing for Forbes. Trump's acting controller of the currency is bullish on Bitcoin, Ether, and XRP. But who is this guy? Okay, so here's the article that he wrote. Trump's new top banking regulator is a Bitcoin bull. And this is for many of you, you may not know what I'm about to show you, but it's pretty unbelievable. Brian Brooks had just become the new top banking re regulator for the Trump administration. His last job, general counsel to crypto powerhouse Coinbase. Brooks, as acting controller, makes it clear blockchain is not the problem. He thinks blockchain is the solution to our problems. Okay, and remember, his boss just happened to step down right as he got appointed as a, uh, as deputy controller. And then his boss steps down, and the guy that used to be the legal counsel over at Coinbase is now your controller. Okay? You can't make this stuff up, folks. Um, he sa it says, Brooks talked with Forbes at length about his views on cryptocurrencies, regulation, technology. Interestingly, he's looking for decentralized net networks. In general, he cited Bitcoin, Ether, and XRP in particular to solve many of the problems hindering more than 1,000 financial institutions under his purview. And then it goes on. Um, let's see. It says, Brooks is especially concerned about the antiquated methods banks use to transfer money. It takes three days if you're trying to send money from the U.S. to Europe on the SWIFT network, says Brooks. Your money is at risk during that period, and even when the money is transmitted, the foreign exchange fees are incurred. But a digital representation of value on both sides of the transaction can eliminate that friction and those costs. Friction is a word that Brad Garlinghouse uses a lot, by the way. Um, and then it goes on down here. Um, if you go down, uh, it says, Brooks expresses a deep understanding about the differences between Bitcoin, Ethereum, and XRP, showing his crypto roots, though he mistakenly calls XRP Ripple. Now, as you go down here, let's look at the part where it talks about, who is this guy? Brooks, professional legacy, surely helped him to get where he is. It all goes back to the last financial crisis, Treasury. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin and One West Bank. And what was One West? A long story to be short. 
in the depths of the 2008 financial crisis, Pasadena-based IndyMac Federal Bank blew up under the weight of lousy Alt-A and reverse mortgages and it had sold to customers. The, the FDIC needed someone to bail out IndyMac, a huge problem as it was the fourth largest bank failure ever. Mnuchin's Los Angeles, Mnuchin steps in. Mnuchin's Los Angeles-based Dune Cap Capital Management stepped in in 2009, forming One West to buy IndyMac and 1 .6 for $1.6 billion. Mnuchin would be the chairman, and in 2011, he brought in Brooks as vice chairman and chief legal officer. In short order, that bargain basement IndyMac purchase yielded $1.9 billion in dividend payments to Mnuchin and his investors, including Texas computer mogul Michael Dell and financiers J. Christopher Flowers, John Paulson, and George Soros. After those payments in just four years, One West had then sold to CIT Group, CIT for another $3.4 billion in 2013. It was the return of a lifetime. And among the government agencies blessing that deal, the comptroller of the currency. All right. So, and remember, folks, Steve Mnuchin was there, right? So Steve Mnuchin, he he then became when this sale happened, he became the the guy that was he was on the board at CIT. And who did they make the legal counsel at CIT? That would be Stuart Alderati, who is now Ripple's general counsel, folks. Does my son need to draw you a picture of Steve Mnuchin, IndyMac Bank, One West Bank, CIT Group, Stuart Alderati, Brian Brooks, and all of these players, and maybe even a creepy photo of George Soros? Folks, you can't make this stuff up. You couldn't write this story. You couldn't. It's all related. They're all freaking related, and none of this happened by accident, folks. Then you've got this one. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm fixing to. I'm, I'm, I'm about to play you something that it, this morning I was listening to it and I was just like, "Whoa!" <laughs> you know how I've told you on this channel that words mean things. I've said that a lot. Well, XRP Yo Yo. I'm about to show you that it's not just words that mean things. It's sounds that mean things. So I'm watching this Visa video, which is all fine and good. XRP Yo-Yo says, what what, v, what does Visa do? The answer might surprise you. So I'll play you a little bit, bit of this, then I'm going to fast forward, but pay close attention. Everyone knows the Visa brand, one of the most trusted and recognizable in the world. But not everyone knows what Visa does. A credit card company. Not a credit card company. It's a bank company. Nope. They loan money. Try again. They lend the money to you and then they charge your bank account later sorry i have no idea oh can I, can I have a clue visa is a payments technology company that facilitates commerce around the world whether you are making a purchase sending money to a friend or part of a business moving money. okay so basically they're telling you it's a payments company but if you go let's see was it about right it was about right in here. All right. So if you get to this point, and as I just told you, <laughs> even if they copyright strike me on this because it's got music in it, it may be that I have to just keep this video together and just not advertise over this one. Because I think that sounds might mean things too. It may not be just words that mean things. Listen here and see if it reminds you of anything, and then I'll show you what it reminds me of. Remember, this is a Visa commercial, folks. Visa. More than 10 million miles in length end to end. The network is made up of five. Well, if I can get it to act right. Ethernet, wireless, satellite, and virtual connections, linking consumers, businesses, governments, and financial institutions. The journey of each transaction starts with you. When you click, swipe, dip, or take. Does that sound, that song that they started playing there, sound familiar to, to you? Because it does sound familiar to me. It sounds just like Ripple's sound that they use on the Ripple Drops. And I wonder if it's a pure coincidence. They have the same soundtrack going over their Ripple Drops as Visa used. Oh, hey, didn't see you there. 
are no coincidences in this game, folks. That's what I've learned. All right, let's give some shout outs to Leonidas. Leonidas um, has, for those of you that don't know, he's got one of the best websites that shows everything you could want to know about Ripple and about XRP. It's called XRP Arcade, xrparcade.com. He, he gave me three great pieces of information. I'm going to go through them real quick. The first one is that the media giant uses Coil for web monetization. This is um, Conde, I think I'm saying this right, Conde Nas is a global mass media company founded in, in 1909 by Conde uh, Montrose Nas and owned by Advanced Publications. Its headquarters are located at One World Trade Center in New York. The company's media brands attract more than 84 million consumers in print and 366 million in digital and 384 million across social platforms. These include Vogue, The New Yorker, GQ, Glamour, Ar Architectural Digest, Vanity Fair, Pitchfork, Wired, and Bon Appetit, among many others. So what we're talking about here, folks, is COIL, which uses XRP for web monetization, is being used by this organization. Now that could be a monster, or at least they're piloting it, one or the other. Either way, this is a big deal. Okay, and then he's got this. He, he added an event. He also, any event related to Ripple, uh, Leonidas puts on his website if you're ever looking for events. Sagar Sarbai, head of regulatory relations at APAC Ripple, to participate in a panel discussion at the Singapore Blockchain Week on July 21st, Blockchain and Digital Payments Unexpected Boost. And then he gives us this, Leonidas, same guy, xrprcade.com. The pound sterling GBP live on Ripple's ODL. More currencies to follow. And I wanted to read you this part here. It was um, it says it, it was a few weeks ago that Ripple ODL partner exchange Bitstamp added GBP trading to its platform. With Bitstamp already being used for USD Euro, it was a matter of time before it would be used for GBP. As soon as the utility scan began picking up on GBP ODL volume, the XRP community is quick to do some digging to find out which company was using it. It was Mora Toomey, utility scans founder, that revealed that Azimo, an online international money transfer company, was the one using ODL in the GBP PHP corridor. So there you go. All right. And now I thought this was a great infographic that DJ Peter Voss. He said, this is big people. Look, cryptocurrency redefining the future of finance. Now, this is from a website that I've shown before called it's visualcapitalist.com. They've created this new graphic. Cryptocurrency redefining the future of finance. You can go down through here and really get a good graphical um, illustration of how everything started. 2009 Bitcoin, 2011 Litecoin, 2012 Ripple. 2013, um, the price of a single Bitcoin hits a thousand, but they take you in a, and the, they're really good with the visuals on all of this. And they take you through everything that has happened here. It says digital ownership can empower those without access to bank to enter the financial system. Bitcoin ripple stellar. And then as you go down, they've got this chart. How can cryptocurrency be used? They've broken it down by payments, store value, storage, utility transactions. They got it rip. They call it Ripple, but they know it's XRP. It's on here. Um, Stellar's on here. Anyway, great graphics there. Now, um, I wanted to uh, finish this video before I show you a quote. I wanted to finish this video by showing you there's a this was a, a Zoom call between one uh, this lady. I think she's got a position at Stellar. And then um, this is Jeremy Allaire at Circle. Okay. And remember, Circle's backed by Goldman Sachs. Jeremy Allaire, there, look, there are three or four companies that are majorly in the game and all the way to the World Economic Forum. And we've seen them. Circle, you know, you got Coinbase in the game, you got Ripple, you got Stellar. And I've, I've, this kind of hammers the point home. At, at, towards the end of this video, you're going to see him make a statement about how Stellar is all over the place with stable coins. You're, you're, look, it's not just Stellar, but it's also XRP. You're going to see stable coins built on these ledgers and, and you're going to, you're going to see it all over the place and they know it. And I just wanted to show you this vi video to further drive point, the home, drive the point home that Stellar is in this game big time, folks.
digital currency realm and, and, and why blockchains? Why this problem right now? Access to uh, the financial system, which we take for granted, I think, from where we sit, uh, just creates an opportunity to be able to do this side right. And what I mean by that is to engage with regulators all over the world to help to create and foster those relationships, to not look to like supplant, but look to enhance a financial system that exists today. Uh, so there's just so much opportunity here, which frankly, not not everyone in the world needs to understand that layer of technology, much like you don't need to understand the underpinning, underpinnings of the internet, but you need to be able to, to gain uh, benefits and to derive value from it. And that's our goal. And so for me, that's just crazy exciting. In terms of 1.7 billion adults globally uh, are unbanked. And so from our standpoint, if you think about that number, but then you juxtapose that with two thirds of them actually have mobile devices. Right. And so if we can actually take those two numbers and put them together and try to solve that problem. Yeah. Yeah. Like you can then, you can see where the value of something like this can happen. You got to think about it as again, like there's this underpinning, which is the blockchain, but then there's stable coins, which you obviously know so much about and how those stable coins interact and create the opportunity to go from fiat currency to digital currency back to fiat. Mm -hmm. So if you so choose and to go in and off and on and off the blockchain, what we really need to do from, uh, you know, Stellar is a public blockchain. Um, and what we really need to do is create those, what we call in our ecosystem anchors. Mm -hmm. So those on ramps and off ramps um, that you can actually get in and out of the blockchain from fiat to digital, digital to fiat. And so our focus, the bite-sized chunk that we're focused on, at least for this year, is really developing even more. We have many that are already participants in the ecosystem. Yeah, I've seen that. Have, a lot of activity in, in, in the stablecoin space with Stellar. And we, have a, and, and we would like a lot more, even Circle. We would like Circle. Um, so we, to, have this, to have these uh, corridors open so that you can actually see payment channels and you can see uh, folks actually interacting and using this for remittances and just for cross-border payments. It's, um, it's already pretty great. <laughs>